Hi, good morning and welcome to Boom It's on the Blockchain. This is our 61st episode and we have a special guest with us today, Grant Blaisdell. How are you, Grant? Hello, Alistair. Thanks for having me. I'm doing really well. Yeah, great. So we've actually had your mother, Lady Rocket, on the show in the past. So, you know, it's good to keep it in the family. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, so so just to kick things off, if you just want to give a bit of background about yourself, Grant. Grant. Sure. Um, so I've always viewed myself as a creator. I had my first startup when I was 19, originally from the LA area. I was operating it out there. Um, and I'm originally focused around digital media distribution and monetization platforms. Even got to work early stage on a project uh, between NBC Universal and Fox that eventually became Hulu. Uh, But at the same time, I was building this idea of, okay, what is going to be the distribution and monetization technology and model for digital media on mobile devices? This was 2006 and 7. So iPhone wasn't even out yet. We're programming on Palm. Uh, My first big lessons on the importance of timing, obviously maturity, you know, since I was 19, et cetera. Um, And that eventually actually got me into blockchain tech. around 2012-ish, 13-ish, as I viewed it as kind of this foundational technology and solution um, to solve these issues or these solutions, build these solutions that I wanted to build around digital media. Um, And then I'm also a musician still to this day. I still am a major shareholder in a pretty substantial music company out here in Europe. Uh, so that drove a lot of the reasons why I was doing what I was doing. I was not just viewing it from like the platform and, um, but also from the creators and the creator of the IP. And, and, and even when we get into Copernic space, um, you know, most of these models and these platforms are going to look very similar because really at the end of the day, uh, we're just dealing with digital IP and in, in some sort of format and how do we distribute, monetize that, et cetera. Um, so once again, that's how I got into blockchain really pretty early. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a speculative minded guy. Um, so that, that wasn't my route into it. Once again, I kind of view it as a technology to apply, to create solutions or create markets in the case of Copernic space. Um, eventually I co-founded and was chief marketing officer for almost five years of coin firm. Coin is one of the leading analytics and AML, which means anti-money laundering. Uh, platforms and solutions on the market. Um, so through that, you know, not only did I get to build a, you know, a globally recognized brand in its field, um, I got to fulfill a, a certain life mission of mine as well, um, which was to show that you can build a global leader in its field as a startup out of Poland. Although it's a London headquartered company, Brains and Braun was out of Poland. Uh, out of Warsaw. I'm my mother's from Warsaw originally, so we 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 take a lot of pride in that, and wanted to show that. Um, and over those years, you know, I got to see under the hood of a lot of different things. So you know, especially when you're looking at like the FTX situation, et cetera. These are things that you know I was working on and highlighting many years ago, uh, and got to work with you know every type of company. You know, we serviced, we're the first to be able to analyze tokens. So we're the first ones to do ICO. So I got to work with every type of blockchain crypto related project you could think of. Um, but I'm third generation aerospace. You know, as you mentioned, you interviewed my mother, Lady Rocket. She's she's second gen technically. Um, so we have, you know, a lifelong multi-generational mission and values that sit behind Copernic Space. Um, and we've been planning on it for a while and building initial aspects of it. Um, but once again, timing's important. Uh, market mentality, even more importantly, was, was not where we needed to be. Neither was Web3 tech. Uh, but in about around 2020, I saw those things aligning. So we decided to formally you know, bring it to market right, and start, start building these commercial cases and setting what we see will become the standards for Um, not just the space economy, but with a lot of things that we do around NFTs and blockchain as well. We hope that those become uh, standards across industries itself and how this technology is applied. Yeah, yeah. So that's super interesting. So so going back to blockchain analytics, 
you know, obviously people speak about blockchain, the technology, what uh, sort of Bitcoin, Ethereum run on. But how does a blockchain analytics company operate for our viewers, viewers to understand? Uh, well, I mean, I, I can only answer for in very broadly how how we applied it. First off, um, you have on chain data. Right. So and, and you have to be analyzing things for a certain end result, right? You want to have a desired end result. Um, so that means you have to build algorithms that are based to provide those sort of analysis for those end results, right? So you can't, you can't treat like AML risk analysis the same way you might treat, you know, uh, certain uh, financial behavioral patterns that are not that, right? That are more like consumer behavioral patterns. Although those things will be close, it's a different algorithm. And they'll, they'll give you those results. So for us, first off, there's on-chain data. So, you know, what a lot of people, especially when crypto is coming out, was like, ah, anonymity, all this sorted up sort of stuff. It's pseudo-anonymous. In reality, outside of Monero, pretty much, crypto is the most traceable and trackable asset that's ever been created. Right. So actually doing analytics for AML for anti money laundering purposes in crypto is dozens and dozens of times more effective than it is in the traditional financial system. So that's one of these arguments that people got really wrong from from the beginning and still sometimes use that argument. I, I still hear that. Um, the other cool thing is not just taking on chain data, which is obviously extremely accurate. Right. And, and valuable. But you can crawl and scrape uh, off chain. So on the web or even on the deep web data, right? Because a lot of also nefarious action when it comes to crypto, but in general is happening on the deep web, right? And uh, you place that in the database and push it through all those algorithms. And in our case, you know, within three seconds, very fast, you're able to get a result back, right? What does that mean? That will usually mean a risk score based off various algorithms, um most a lot of exchanges or major companies or hot wallets are identified so a lot of times you can identify a commercial entity you can't even though if you could uh, or you had this info you can't identify private individuals it breaks you know the us is a little different around that but in europe you know that that breaks gdpr laws etc um and then you can go like you can go really deep and then there's the forensic end which is like okay well here's the automated solution right so you can make these choices but what if you need to take a deeper dive right so blockchain is actually quite amazing at, at that too because once again every transaction is there immutably right and you can tie these things together really well so uh in reality and this is why people are scared of also central bank digital currencies right, which you might have discussed before on, on your show with CBDCs, is because the government will be able to track, analyze, and do things they've never, ever been able to do before uh, once that happens. Because one of the horrible things about the traditional financial system is that they're all data silos, you know, they're all segmented, right? It's not this horizontal data sort of access, right? Blockchain changes that in a lot of ways, right? Uh, depending on the network, but pretty universally. So, um, you know, there's no such thing that's 100% good, right? And and we need to also kind of acknowledge, you know, what are some of these aspects around crypto that, that you know, like people, people want transparency on everything but themselves. And it's very hard to build a system like that. So um, I hope that was a good enough answer initially, at least. Yeah, and it, so you know we have we've had a few people now on the show speaking about central bank digital currencies. So and it's you know quite often it's different conflicting advice. One of the guy we had Emmanuel Daniel who was a Asian banker. Now he was involved in uh, advising central banks over in Asia, in Hong Kong, etc. And he ultimately thinks that because the technology is evolving so quickly that it's going to be quite difficult for them to put out a central bank digital currency that's going to sort of replace the dollar, et cetera, there as well. Because there's so many more, because there's like, he, the way he spoke about it is, in something like Cardano, there's 300,000 developers, and a central bank digital currency for one of these Asian countries is like 30. So he says, how can the technology keep up? But what's your thoughts on the technology aspect of it? I... I, I Maybe I don't have full context. I don't 
kind of agree with with what he says. I mean, you know, if the federal government wants to introduce something, they will introduce it by force or you not need it. I mean, our money's already digital, right? All they have to worry about is phasing out cash. It's a matter of kind of switching out the back end system that's dealing with the digital stuff that's, that's there anyways. My guess is that they'll only apply it towards kind of consumer retail applications, but we shall see. I mean, I don't like, yeah, okay, governments don't produce in the private market the same results that private companies do. But if it comes to if they really put money behind, you know, advancing technology, it's, you know, if we look at we look at any advanced technology, usually even the Internet, space tech, etc. Initially, it's government sponsoring or pushing a lot of the boundaries on that. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like I'm my thing is, is if people are worried about cbdc's which i think they should um that you fight the measures such as elimination of cash um you fight those measures right so for example nordic countries pretty much gave up on that already right so for them it's just it's a matter of turning on the light like people don't care what like what is the protocol or what's the thing working behind things they just care about you know their usability of it so uh, I don't, I kind of don't get that. I mean, I get the point. I just, I probably don't think it'll be the case. Does that mean that it'll take the government's 10 years to properly roll out CBDCs? Maybe. Yeah. Well, I, I know I've, well, I've been researching quite a bit and I know the, the, the Chinese, the digital currency, the UN, Y-U-A-N, um, they've already started to use it. So they've done like 23 million in transactions in it. And then what they're talking about is that, uh, you know, as I think it's 128 countries now across the world, China's their number one trading partner. It, everything's still in the dollar, but ultimately they could potentially use this to become the number one currency in the world by 2030. Because if they suddenly say, well, we no longer want to be paid in dollar internationally, we want to be paid in our new digital currency, which is, they're talking about being five years ahead of everyone else. You know, how, how are you going to stop doing that then, Grant? You know what I mean? It's I just think, like... I think, it's, I think for the Chinese especially, it's more about capital flight. So they're already controlling, you know, if you cross the street wrong in, in China, uh, you know, they'll take out the, the ticket out of your bank account right away. If the AI catches you doing it, identify, they take it out. Um, I don't know about the global implications of, of you know, the US against the USD, et cetera. My, my bigger thing is capital flight for, especially when it comes to China. That's why crypto is constantly being blocked and made illegal is because they have no way of controlling it from capital flight. And you got to understand the average Chinese citizen can only uh, export $50,000 a year maximum, right? Uh, whereas if they keep it within the country, there's no investment vehicles for it other than real estate, which is pretty much a house of cards. You never own it. Right. So, I mean, I'm like, I've spent, I spent a lot of time, you know, trying to understand kind of how, how China works and also don't get into their five years ahead thing. It's, it's generally propaganda. They, in my viewpoint. Right, right, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I think the argument there was the fact that they're already using it and other countries are doing white papers. But as you say, it's like, how long does it take to actually implement it? I think one of the things that they've been pushing as a narrative in the UK, etc., is that uh, if you start using a CBDC out there and the government's getting, you know, you're in some form of benefits and you're getting benefits from the government, uh, you can no longer go and buy vodka and cigarettes with it because that purchase now, you, you just get put the money in. They call it your gyro out there. So you get the money put in and you can go and spend this money. And then, then there's this idea that everybody who's on benefits are spending all their money in cigarettes and vodka. Uh, but under the new CBDC, it'll be, they won't be able to use that money because it'll be controlled. So if you went in to try and buy something with it, it would actually block you actually buying to, uh, this particular product. And that, that's, that's a scary thought, but they're actually, they're actually pushing that as a positive, you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, they're obviously over the past few years, they're well, not past few years and generally, you know, it's about pushing, pushing something that might not be good for, for people as make them feel that it's good for them. But I mean, back to the analytics thing, just imagine, you know, applying an AML system like that on something that is 100% government controlled in that sort of manner, right? Like, 
you know, tracking and tracing the movement of funds, et cetera, is going to be um, a different level. Yeah, that's super interesting. So let's move on to your current project then, Copernicus Space, and I'll let you give a bit of background for it, then I'll bring up your website so people can see. Sure. Uh, you can also bring up the, the app and Spaceables because I'll eventually speak about that. Um, so as, as mentioned, Copernic Space is, is technically a three-generation story that started with my grandfather who helped build the space program in Poland. He has these early works and writings around the idea of democratizing access to space. Um, you know, for him, that wasn't some marketing term. It was a, a real life goal, so to say. Um, my mother's been active in the space economy for decades. Um, me, uh, almost a decade in some manner, but obviously I've been born into it. And we realized about seven years ago through our activities in the Lady Rocket Foundation, on the ground with entrepreneurs, especially around Vandenberg Space Force Base and looking how kind of things um, acted there. Uh, and also considering our backgrounds, both Lady Rockets and mine around, you know, digital platforms, et cetera, we realized that pretty much the most important need and opportunity that's going to exist potentially in mankind's history is to build what we kind of call the economic or the commercial and financial infrastructure for the new space economy, right? Where is the marketplace for space? And where is the new investment models and solutions for the space economy? How do we digitize, scale, and streamline the business processes that already do exist in space, while at the same time enabling not just the wider commercial market, but also potentially the general public into access, ownership, as well as investments in the space economy? Right. So what we're building at Copernic Space is the economic infrastructure for the new space economy built on top of it are applications that enable the commercial and the retail market and these space companies to connect, transact, uh, create space assets, space investments, and also have secondary markets to these assets and to these investments. Right. Obviously, one of the big things around. Uh, crypto and, and applying things like NFTs is that you can totally take advantage of secondary markets in, in a different way, right? So we we have a long-term vision. Um, initially, we launched something called Spaceables. So Spaceables is now the, the largest Web3 market for space art, collectibles, digital fashion, music, etc., uh, we've been supporting space art uh, as individuals and as a company for, for years. We even did the first ever physical space art NFT exhibition. Uh, we did that the other year in Palm Beach. Um, and we also, you know, had a lot of words, so to say, from space organizations, creators, et cetera, that, hey, there's no place like this. Uh, we heard you guys want to create it, so create it. So we created Spaceables also to drive the general public and this creator community onto our platform so that we can also eventually convert them and empower them to be real owners uh, in the space economy, right? Um, a lot of people don't get that the space economy isn't just Bezos, Musk, and NASA and a few other billionaires. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of private companies around the world that are creating or are in the process of creating what we call space assets, right? So how do we build that bridge between those 10,000 companies and the hundreds of thousands of companies and potentially millions of individuals that want to have access to those companies or their space assets? Yeah, I brought up the, the sell space assets on your website right now. So just explain in detail what's happening here just for people to try and understand it. Right. So I mentioned Spaceables, which kind of onboards, you know, the general public in this cool arts, et cetera, way. What you're looking at here is what we call Space, space Mart. So this is the marketplace for space assets. So this is where we enable space companies to tokenize their space assets, such as physical payload. In this case, what you're looking at going to the moon. Uh, what we really love is satellite imagery and data as licenses, right? 
Um, so we enable these space companies to tokenize these assets, introduce utility rights, et cetera, under these assets, which are actually NFTs. The user doesn't need to know that, you know, NFTs, I always say NFTs are a, uh, a vehicle, right? They're a tool with certain features, functions, benefits for an asset. It's not the asset itself. Right. So in our case, we use it to tokenize, let's say, a ton of physical payload going to the moon. The space company attaches whatever rights or utilities are attached. And through fractionalization, we enable them taking something that is usually not economically viable for majority of the commercial market, let alone the normal person, and fractionalize that into these more consumable amounts. So you know, a user can come on, he can see an offer. Well, there's one ton. What's the minimum? Minimum's 10 grams. Okay, let me buy 10 grams, right? And what that actually does is it burns off and creates a new token that's tied to the original one, like a parent-child relationship that now represents the ownership, access, and rights for this entity that bought it, right? And we built the interfaces to where they can share agreements, etc. And the real kind of extra value that we bring is listen it's it's already billions and billions and billions of dollars in value and being able to streamline and connect that initial transaction but like with physical payload the cool thing about that is is take an example like spacex spacex's main business model is physical payload they get paid to send people stuff into space but the moment i put something in there i'm creating a whole new space asset so not only do we enable you to buy, you know, the rights access and fulfill that, but the moment that you do fulfill that, you can transform that to represent your new asset. Just as a fun example, let's say Nike wants to send shoes to the moon, right? Okay, well, they can discover the offer, they can acquire the rights. And when the shoe's up there, in there and goes up, they can transform that to now represent their shoe that's either going or is on the moon. And they can further fractionalize, attach utilities and sell that on this marketplace. So we just took one asset, right? Did one transaction of it that created a new asset that let's say they fractionalized into a hundred thousand pieces and turned into a hundred thousand new transactions, right? So you're going to see this whole economic chain happening across our marketplace with the utilities attached. So the reason space smart isn't securities, right, which we'll get into later, is because these have actually utilities and rights attached to it, right? And then there's a secondary market, once again, where you can further sell and, and trade these things. As I mentioned, we really love this when it comes to satellite imagery and data. We think that will really change how the world works is if we open up access to satellite imagery. We have really great initiatives like Satellite Rhino, um, which is a, a joint, uh, which is a partnership with Saving the Survivors, which is a premier uh, anti-poaching organization in South Africa, right? And you can go and check them out and watch their videos, what they do on the daily. Um, so we have initiatives on Spaceables to help fund basic resources for them using space art inspired with rhinos. But on Space Mart, uh, our initiative is to enable them to acquire licenses as nfts for let's say you know 10 photos right instead of having to do how it is today which is you know to do anything in space is pretty much a year-long contracting process and you know seven figures contract right or in this case organizations like that can enter a marketplace buy a license for let's say 10 photos and through that nft they actually access the API to start querying for these photos under that license, right? So providing a whole new layer of utility functionality and a standard uh, to how NFTs have been applied. And in this case, when it comes to satellite imagery and data, and, and we really believe that if you democratize that, that access to it, that, that you really can change the world in very distinct ways. Yeah, so, so let's speak about, I'll bring this back into the stream just now as well in regard to the data piece. So I think for me to understand, I can see the value in owning the data of satellite imagery because just for people to understand right now, it's like who actually owns satellite data right now? It's very, very small amount of people, isn't it? 
Uh, well, it's, it's ownership is kind of the key word when it comes to that. Um, when it comes to satellite imagery and data, for us, it's mainly about access, right? And can you get it quickly, cheap, and in a way that you can apply and have effects? You know, uh, data run data is the most valuable thing in the world, right? And uh, if, if we're enabling the commercial market to more easily access this data and do so securely, because remember, like the cool thing also why blockchain is also great for space is that it's very much a peer to peer environment. Yeah, you don't have to have intermediaries around the funds, the data, the assets themselves. So if we can provide that secure access, whether you're a farmer, right, who's in the middle of, let's say, Asia or, or Africa, whether, you know, we have a partner that they're a farmer in, in the United States, right? So if, if you can really enable this, um, the on earth effects are going to be amazing. I mean, one, one thing we saw at the outbreak of the Ukraine war is how important satellite imagery was, right? That was one of the times in the recent memory where people really got it, had it thrown in their face, like what the capabilities are. It's not Google Maps, right? Yeah. And I think for people to understand that as well. So, you know, it's Elon Musk was able to put a satellite over there whereby essentially Russia knocked out all the ability for people to get access online. And again, with any wars, there's propaganda coming from either side. But if the people on the ground can't upload videos of what's going on, then, you know, we are sort of blindsided to what's happening in the country, whereby him putting his satellite above Ukraine, suddenly it allowed the people in Ukraine to start uploading videos within the country that we could actually start to access. And I think that's, well, that's, data, that's, that's data going upstream. So in, in space, like you have upstream and downstream, right? Upstream okay. is generally rockets, everything that's going up. Downstream is like satellite imagery and data that's coming down. So in, in that case, you know, people wouldn't even be able to downlink the, the imagery, let's say, that they need in, in, the, in the first place. So, you know, that, that, that goes both ways. And people forget that, major, you know, this, this is space tech. You know, like almost everything we're we're using that's really crucial technologically on a day to day basis is originally developed for space in space by space. Um, so we also know that um, being able to empower these entrepreneurs in the space economy. So once we get into the financing part of the discussion um that it's also gonna it's also gonna scale up the types of solutions that that these guys are are bringing to to earth sorry just from your website again there grant it, it just explain how you're using the data to uh, assist with endangered rhinos so, so once again we're you know we're a web3 platform so these aren't our assets we are hosting these assets. So what we're working with right now is with satellite players to create the, the standard, the process to where um, saving the survivors. So in this case, the entity that is, you know, doing this on the ground work with endangered rhinos can come on our marketplace. They can pick a provider or a solution, acquire a license for, X amount of times or uh, unlimited access per month or what you're going to be seeing that's really interesting about space is that things will be measured in time, right? So you will be buying X amount of time capacity on a satellite, but that's a whole nother discussion. Whatever the unit of measure of their license is, they get an NFT, a license, but it's an NFT format. And directly through that on our marketplace, they boom, they access it acts like a key into the API for the satellite images under that license. So whatever the terms are per month, a hundred images, whatever it is, and they can start querying, requesting those images. Obviously the images need to be approved by the provider. Cause you know, someone can come in and just be like, show me area 51. Right. But, uh, query them approved. And then it comes back to them and they have the image or whatever the data is that they want. And they can keep querying that as long as it fulfills their license. If the original asset creator, um, so the one who the satellite company, 
if they want to enable for resale on the secondary market, that that entity that purchased it and let's say only used half of it can sell the other half on the secondary market as well. Right. So also introducing a new kind of life to these a revenue life and stream to these assets as well. Yeah. So, so try and explain a little bit more for the revenue models of these then you just touched on it briefly, but just a bit more in detail for people to understand that. Yeah. So I, once again, there's, there's huge amounts of value in creating that initial transaction. But if you're able to take that asset and give her a long, give it a longer, let's say, revenue life, uh, then that's amazing. And, and one of the things around, you know, Web3 and, and how you can apply NFTs, uh, we even built something within the platform, a feature called second generation royalties. Right. So let's take the example of, of payload space. I'm SpaceX. I sell this payload to Nike. We can use that example as well. Right. Well, they created this original asset that gave Nike the capability to create their own asset in the first place. So when this new asset is created by Nike, this moon shoe that they fractionalize in 100,000 pieces and sell, SpaceX and Nike can have it um, written into the smart contract that they both earn a percentage off every single secondary sale. And what you saw in certain things happening on the NFT marketplace is that good projects, some of them were earning more off secondary sales, even though it's a much, much, much smaller percentage than they were off the primary sales, right? So if, if I'm a, a space company, um, if I'm a space company and I'm creating this value, but it's being used further on, I should be eating off that value, um, as well. So like in the satellite imagery aspect, although I think there'll be a lot less of this for satellite imagery than there will be for like kind of physical um, kind of more novelty consumer facing aspects, like I mentioned with Nike, uh, there still will be a secondary market where, you know, the satellite company could earn off further sales of the same asset. Right. So we're creating really, like I said, the economic operating system for the space economy. It's not just about, hey, post your listing here, you buy here and we're done. Right. Like that's why, you know, my mother sometimes she's like, you know, it, it cheapens us to call us like a marketplace or like, look what eBay did for retail and the web boom. Right. Like she feels that cheapens us because our models are very deep when it comes to that event. Yeah, it's, it's, it's how the actual economic model works for the whole thing. I yeah, think yeah. For, for a lot of people out there, it's, it's that part. They, it's just trying to get their head around the technology coming in. So they just see with that. So you're talking about thousands of companies involved in space. So is it from the new technology that so many are coming in? Or, you know, just give a bit of background about that. As in you're asking, why is the market growing, growing so quickly? Yeah. Why is it growing so quickly now? Uh, a lot. Well, a lot of barriers, some barriers have been broken, right? So costs are getting a lot lower, right? We got, we have a partner we're starting our collaboration with an Italian company where they're going to be launching they're going to be launching like micro CubeSats. These are smaller rockets. Um, you know, they're not launching people. Um, but I, I think it can still go up to, I, it's still a large payload. Um, and I, I mean, they're going to be doing it for like 20,000 bucks, something like that, up and down, right? It also comes back down. Uh, so one thing for sure people can thank Musk for is he kind of, broke that barrier down in some things. So the costs are going down. Uh, but I think the, the understanding that this is going to be a major commercial market, like people don't get it. Space is already a $500 billion industry, right? It's just that it's mainly facing towards governments. It hasn't yet opened towards the commercial market, which is the big opportunity, right? So I, I think people see that, you know, the people who, run the space economy, run its pipes, um, that they're going to be, you know, it's going to be the largest new wealth generating event potentially in human history. And it'll be, you know, the creation of 
probably what's going to be the most valuable market, not just economically, but but once again, in kind of results it can provide on Earth. So, you know, um, I think people have been inspired to be a lot more entrepreneurial. And I think people are realizing that space needs every type of person. And I'm, I'm no rocket scientist. OK, my my grandfather kind of was, but I'm no rocket scientist. So, you know, space needs better marketing people. It needs a different type of salespeople. And it needs people such as myself who are viewing this from a macroeconomic solution perspective and want to build, you know, the the market for for space, right? Just like, you know, people thought it was abstract buying books online. You know, you could just go to Borders, and if they didn't have it, they would order it for you, and you'd come and pick up. And you you can talk to Jan, the nice lady at, you know, at at Borders, that uh, you know knows all your favorite books, but that's not how markets have matured or developed. And space is not going to be, um, space is not going to be spared from that. It's just one of the last to go through it. And the coolest thing about space though, when it comes to blockchain is that it's perfectly built for it. And it also doesn't have the hundred plus years of administrative kind of regulatory bureaucratic things stacked on top of each other like other markets do, which have made it very hard to change it from its foundation, right? Like real estate is a good example. You see some tokenization plays with real estate, but it's really hard, right? It's really hard to do. Whereas with us, our biggest our biggest worry regulatory wise as a company, uh, once again, because these aren't our assets, we're not launching anything. We don't have to deal with like FAA regulations. Our biggest worry is, um, is securities regulations right and and aml and kyc right so also you know we built in features to make sure that the space companies can follow you know their rules because for example a u.s space company can't sell access or assets to chinese nationals or companies whether it's primary or secondary markets so you have to build in those sort of things in the product as well so you originally spoke about it being more like utility tokens rather than, say, security tokens or securities. How how can you differentiate that? Because obviously everything that's happening with regulation in the US right now is one of the big things is how many of these original early cryptocurrencies or utilities were actually securities and the SEC are coming after them. Well, major, majority of those were securities. Right. Majority of them have have no utility. They would say that there's a future stated utility, um, you know, but there was no solution where you could use them or anything like that. And, you know, a lot of them would just be like, hey, well, you can now pay for this thing with it like or something. Right. Um, so a lot of those were securities. Um, but I think that ICO boom actually highlighted highlighted a lot of what we're about to see in space and, and what Copernic space is going to be bringing into space which is, um, you know, the people funded the blockchain industry, right? It, for two years straight, the, until regulators came in, the general public outfunded all the VCs in the world combined when it comes to this technology. And that was the core time of building a lot of the companies we, we see today, right, that are, that are in the crypto space. Um, so we think space is going to be very similar. There's not enough money in governments and VCs or risk tolerance, especially in VCs nowadays, uh, to fund everything that's needed in space. And also the financing models, <clears throat> uh, the models and the market needs to be different for space, um, a little bit different. So the differentiation for us is that's why we have Space Mart. And then hopefully end of next year, we'll launch the first couple, iter like the first couple examples of what we call Space Pool. So this is the DeFi application for space. Uh, but, you know, I have a regulatory kind of background. Um, these will be securities. They need to be treated as securities. We will have kind of a Kickstarter model to launch in the beginning, which is, you know, you get some NFT with utilities, benefits, et cetera, that won't be treated as securities, right? It'll be like a cool way to, to fundraise from your community and et cetera, uh, but they won't be securities. Uh, but majority of things will be securities and we acknowledge that we're not going to be running from it so that's one reason why it's a little bit later in the timeline is because you know you, you need to do that properly and go through the proper um proper processes when it comes to that so in in the case of space pool um obviously we'll we'll be looking t for space companies to be able to tokenize themselves so to say uh as shares 
uh, security tokens and offer that. Um, but also introduce a different kind of what you could call security token, which I think will also eventually be used as a standard in, in markets that are also high investment, high risk, um, such as film, right? So you're not investing in the company itself. You're investing in the asset or the creation of the asset. And instead of your tokens being tied to rights to shares, your tokens are being tied to rights to future revenue, commercial revenue or profit that that asset creates. So let's say, you know, I brought the film industry example. Instead of investing into Universal Studios, you're investing into the Avengers movie, right? If you can look at it that way. So in the space example, it's you're not investing into the satellite company. You're investing into their new satellite constellation that they're building and they're going to launch. And it, here's its revenue model. And here's how it's, you know, going to be commercialized. And here's our expected X. And you own X percent of the revenue or the profit, you know, over time. If it blows up and doesn't work, well, there goes your investment, right? Uh, but but we think that's going to be a really amazing and important model, not just for space, but like I said, pretty much any industry that has that sort of dynamic. Yeah, the same with like all tokenization of assets. I think uh, tokenization, they had uh, uh, Goldman Sachs speaking about this being the next big thing coming through because suddenly you're tokenizing various asset pools for people to understand is that, and it provides them distributions. I think the terminology is that one of the big barriers for people right now, Grant, because it, it's confusing to people because they're not prepared to understand it. But as you say... Sorry to interrupt. To what you said, uh, there's something important when it comes to space as well, as which is the secondary market. Space investments practically have very hardcore liquidity. Like, you know, if you're lucky, like 10-year liquidity event timeline from your investment, which obviously limits how much people want to put into space, right? So if we build a model, a tokenized model with a secondary market that provides this very fast liquidity for your investments, so like... You know, we, we even have, I don't talk about it as much, but, you know, like even for guys like Musk, you know, he still has to go and get fundraising every couple of years, right? Well, what if, and he has billions of dollars in contracted revenue. What if he could leverage those contracts in like a pool from the public, you know, and just ask the public for that money at, at a set rate. And like I invested in, or I bought it and it's like, you know, I get paid back 5% within this time frame. Well, I don't want to wait that much longer. Let me let me sell it to this guy at 3% and he'll redeem the 5%, right? Like if you create a market like that, you can totally change how much money is moving through the space economy. So um, so that whole secondary market providing, you know, th that better flow of funds uh, between entities we think is going to be critical for, for space. Yeah, so so essentially, your platform is really a secondary trading platform f for the space assets. Yeah, well, we have the primary market as well, but there's a secondary market attached to it, just like you would, just like you would look at, uh, you know, the major NFT marketplaces. Yeah, just like any form of exchange that's coming out now, you've got primary offering listings, investing, secondary offering, your ability to sell your asset if required. Right. But you want to hold on to it because essentially you're holding on to this asset to provide you distributions over the time period of the right, right. proposal. But people, but people should, you know, if possible, they should have the option, right? And I think what a lot of people, you know, why startup investing is especially hard is because it's it's really hard to get your money out, right? So if if you create a model that, and you know, I've been in that position as a startup founder, it's like, okay, I got shares worth a lot of money, but what do I do now? You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what there. But again, I think as these new tr secondary trading platforms come online, it's going to make it easier for people to actually move in and out of different projects going forward. It's just that you're going to be doing this with the, the space economy. Correct. Correct. Correct, which, which we think is going to be the largest and most valuable and most important one. Yeah. So, so what size is, so if it's worth 500 billion now, in say five years from now, what do you think the market size is going to be in 10 years? Well, the, the estimates are that by the end of this decade, it'll be a trillion or more. 
Um, I think that's a low shot. Um, we have on our advisory board, Kevin O'Connell, who's the former director of space commerce for the U.S. Department of Commerce, someone who's really been pushing the the idea of going commercial and private within government halls for decades and and also obviously does a lot in the private industry so he thinks it'll be closer to three trillion by the beginning uh somewhere around the beginning of next decade potentially with a trillion of that uh being tied just to the moon right so a lot of people don't understand that the infrastructure is being built these next couple of years on the moon. You know, there's entities testing internet connectivity through the moon. There's going to be entities testing transactional capabilities directly from the moon, uh, you know, streaming like it's there's there's an entire economy and a lot of the you can't call them geopolitical battles technically, but you're going to see loads of 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 battles between nations and private companies as well when it comes to these ownership and natural resources on the moon and in space it's like it's like the discovery of the new world in a sense by by columbus whereas you know okay how do we who owns what what are the rules behind it what are what are the commercial sort of standards behind it etc so one thing we're really looking to do is to standardize a lot of things so that you know this market can run very very smoothly as more assets are onboarded into you know the market you know what what's going to be the model when we do start mining asteroids right what uh how do we how do we uh chop up and sell ownership or access to things on the moon right so that's obviously you know models we're trying to bring in right and now that hopefully uh you know set the standard for decades to come yeah, so well, I think that's a great way to finish the show then. Is there anything else you'd like to add just now then, Grant? Um, space is for everyone. Space is not some distant and inaccessible thing. It's not just for billionaires. And once again, the people who plant their flag in it early, just like crypto like 10 years ago, you know, uh, people who plant their flag early in, in this market should should reap the, the benefits of it. Once again, not just economically, uh, but but also, you know, results here on Earth. Uh, please follow us across social media. You can find us at Copernic Space um, and go to Spaceables. It's already live. There's a live largest digital market for all things kind of space related like that. Uh, we have great initiatives on it as well that have have higher value here on Earth, like Satellite Rhino, as well as our Space for Ukraine initiatives, as we have lots of artists and team members um, that are on the ground in Ukraine as well. So, you know, those purchases actually, you know, kind of help save people's lives in, in some manner. Um, you know, we, we showed that off at Art Basel this, this past week in Miami. Uh, but keep following us. Um, we're a very unique company in this space, uh, pun intended. Um, and I look forward to coming on here again, Alistair. And thanks for having me and, and Lady Rocket, my mother, last time. Yeah, well, thanks very much then, Grant. We'll put all the URLs in the show notes as well so people can uh, access it from there. Thank you. And thanks to the supporters who came in in the comments. I appreciate that as well. Okay, that, that's great. So, well, thanks very much, Grant. Thanks very much to everyone at Copernicus Space. You've been watching Boom It's on the Blockchain. My name's Alistair Caithness. Have a nice day.